We've got a special treat for you guys today on the podcast, a Star Trek The Next Generation series review. Also talking about Ghostbusters re-reboot news, Nobel Prize winner gets stripped, and in a Patreon exclusive, President Trump serves McDonald's. Hey, I have a lot to complain about, so let's do this. So being a Netflix subscriber, you know, this is, if you're listening to this in the future, before Netflix goes bankrupt, I checked out Star Trek The Next Generation. This was a show I've long considered one of my favorites. To the best of my knowledge, this seems to be the best Star Trek TV series, though I haven't seen all of them in their entirety. And you know, I don't like to assign a point value to a TV series, because we all have good and bad episodes. It's very hard to judge TV series, especially if you haven't seen all of them. Now, if something's new and in development, I will tell you out the gate if the pilot sucked or not. In this case, I watched every episode of Star Trek TNG. It took me some time to get through them, you know, when I'm not doing these movie reviews nobody watches. And I just thought I'd give you some uh, thoughts that I haven't really heard shared elsewhere regarding this series. Now, first, let me break down the principal characters here. We're going to uh, focus on the the primary cast as those who remained for most of the season. Uh, I'm not looking at... Uh, Dion- uh, Tasha Yar so much she shows up and gets killed off right and I'm not looking I'm not gonna like grind into Wesley Crusher but but anyways we've got Picard here Captain Jean-Luc Picard USS Enterprise you know now this is a very odd character in the sense that he's billed as from France sounds very English now I've seen a few movies where everybody is supposedly from France and sounds like they're sp- they're speaking like Queen Mary English. Like w- watch the Day of the Jackal. Everybody's French sounds English. Well, here Jean Luc Picard is an interesting captain to me because he doesn't look like a-, a guy ready for action. He's bald as all shit. Has the 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 micro Hulk Hogan skullet type thing going around the side with the gray. It's not an appealing look, but despite what's working against him, and and, you know, not an imposing stature, uh, svelte, he isn't a big guy, but he commands authority, and Patrick Stewart does a bang-up job in every damn scene he's in, and I think that gives a lot of credence to the show and allows much of it to be taken more seriously than if a lesser actor was present. So he's certainly the nucleus. And we have William Riker, Jonathan Frakes. He's more the everyman. He has charisma. He's charming. He's second in command, but he's treated as though he has the personality of William Shatner's Captain Kirk in many ways. Like, he's the ladies' man. He does a little bit of gambling. He'll bluff. Uh, he can get pushy at times. He has the the most mixed emotions here, uh, as far as what we're shown here. Like he's not necessarily vulnerable, but he'll display a wide range. Commander Data is a really good choice for a character. You know, you're coming off of having a science officer second in charge in the form of the Vulcan Spock. And you say, look, we don't need to have a Vulcan in every show, do we? This is only our second attempt at a Star Wars show. Do we really need to go the Vulcan route? We have a lot more stuff we can talk about. This is supposed to be, what is it, like 300 years later? At least 200. But the point is, you got this guy who's an android. And he's a unique android, although he has brothers. People are concerned if he is a sentient being. There's philosophy waxed about this. He's a growing mechanism. In the early episodes, someone uses a figure of speech. What does Data do? Immediately questions it, needs a source of origin, how this become used. He doesn't stop. By the time you get to like season seven, he's less about that. He's ready to give orders. He expects people to follow them. He has a sense of duty. 
and the there are some interesting plot quirks that can come about from data he's he can be a hindrance at times oh all of a sudden data's act, acting erratic well he can beat up anybody on the ship what are we going to do oh well we can't blame him it's not his choice this sort of thing will happen there are times also where everybody gets knocked unconscious, but only Data can remember, and he makes a truce with some passing aliens to reset all the clocks, and and they'll let them escape their their clutches and all this stuff, but no one has to know about it, and he agrees. It, it, things like that'll happen too. Data's really cool. Counselor Troy is, and at the time watching this, I mean, I was a little kid. I remember when the last season was on, I was watching it new, and this was on... It was on the NBC affiliate in my town, and I thought the show was pretty badass, and, you know, it's sad to see it go and all this stuff, and I didn't realize at the time that Troy was such a shithead, but you hear those sort of things later on, like, everybody hates Troy later, right? Everybody hates Troy, everybody hates uh, Wesley Crusher, but to really point out how useless this gal is, she's a half Beta Z, half human, doesn't have telepathy powers, but can sense emotions. So, like, they'll bring somebody up on the view screen, some some new passing alien, and she'll go, I'm sensing fear and hostility. And like, oh, gosh, what a wizard. <laughs> hmm. I can't sense anything from this guy. So your powers are to sense things except when you can't. And then there's this episode where this guy, Ronnie Cox, shows up, and he's Captain Jellico. It's unintentionally hilarious. He gets the ship in, in, in ready to fight. Uh, so I forgot who who's he going up against? Was it the Kardashians? And he's like, "Hey, every, we we have certain orders around here. You know, there, I expect this, Counselor Troy. You're not wearing pajamas anymore. Get a regulation uniform, you bitch." He has a meeting and he gives everybody specific commands and doesn't even say anything to Troy. It's like we expect heavy casualties. Dr. Crusher, get this them ready. All right, Wyker, you do this. Worf, man, Bowser doesn't even say anything to Troy, just she's that useless. I love it. Worf. Worf is an interesting character because he is of a race that is villainous in the original Star Trek series and movies for that matter. Several of the movies, you have Kirk going at it with the Klingons or some kind of conflict. But he's a very honorable character. I think that the Klingons are made up as something of a Japanese samurai. They're into their love poetry, they have combat, they have specific weaponry, things are sacred, uh, honor above all. You have a whole race about fighting conflicts and dying on the sword. Would they ever really be able to get a starship out the dock? Like, how do they come across that? Yeah, they would be very slow getting there, right? It's odd to see that Worf is in the Federation. He's the only Klingon in the Federation. And then you have the wishy-washy relationship with the Klingon Empire. And Worf's involvement in that inadvertently puts Picard and the Enterprise, which, though being the flagship of the Federation, they're always at the center of some kind of weird infighting thing with the hierarchy of the Klingon Empire. Well, we have to go to, to Kronos because somebody had... <laughs> had uh, adjourned a meeting or something. It's like, now they have to appoint this guy, so we need someone to uh, oversee the succession. Uh, Picard, can we maybe get you to do that? It's odd how... I, I feel like Picard's reluctant to get in here, but he's this student of culture and uh, archaeology and all these things, and so he's interested in other people's... Uh, well, being like that, and, and maybe that makes him a good captain. But with Worf, you have the only character who gets a kid, though he's somewhat infrequently seen, and I know that the first actor who played his kid died. Rip, uh, did he kill himself, I think it was? Yeah, but um, he has a love interest, and she dies, like, really damn quick. Uh, he has a brother. He has adopted parents. A lot of the family angles run around Worf. Geordie LaForge. At first, the gimmick was, it's interesting having the black blind guy who has this visor because his eyes don't work, to have him flying the starship. It's interesting to do that. That was the gimmick at first. But they move him into engineering, and he has like a whole different play set. Like, he has to man the, 
the warp coils and, and the lithium crystal chamber, all this stuff, he it becomes Jordy's responsibility to throw out the techno babble. Well, the positrons, it's like, well, the neutrinos. Can we get a tractor beam on the to reverse cycle the you know uh, temporal field like this, things like that will happen, and it's up to Jordy to decipher and kind of be a liaisons between the techno babble and communicating that to Picard in English. Uh, Doctor Crusher, I think Doctor Crusher has if you if you watch the episodes, particularly in the last couple seasons, has a, a weird relationship with death because nobody kills anything on the show except dr crusher somebody will there'll be a plot and then dr crusher's like well i guess i have to put the phaser on max setting it's the only way to do it yeah he had he had a, a force filler some special shit i knew being i, I don't know how powerful he was bam done dr crusher will save a life and she will take a life damn it now i want to talk about the uniforms real quick I think the uniforms are pretty boss, even the, the first ones that were more pajama-inspired. I didn't really have a problem with. I understand that you have this thing with the Picard maneuver where he's pulling down the shirt uh, when he sits down and gets up because it's kind of bubbling. I think the cool thing about the uniforms here is you can very quickly identify rank by the circles. Yes, you have these little circles. They're filled in or they're a ring, and at first I thought... Is it a, like a gold ring type thing or a brass ring? No, it's not. It's it's filled in black. And you can see the reflection in these HD treated episodes that Netflix has out there. Well, upscaled. But I mean, they, the show looks as good as it ever did. And with the circles, you can identify very fast these ranks. I didn't even realize these insignias were present on, say, the first six Star Trek movies. I couldn't tell what the, what they were going by with what was on their collar, but oh, the sh but up on their collar they got like four circles as captain. Bam, you got like some you got like the four circles with like a uh, well or or kind of bracket around it. Bam, that's admiral. You know you go down to three. I don't see anybody with three and a half. You know three circles in a in a unfilled circle, but three's commander. You get, you get a few commanders running around. Then you got like a lieutenant commander. It's like two. And then you have a ring. And then you have like the lieutenant, which is two. And then you got like, I think there's ensign and chief. And maybe ensign's just the circle, but chief might be circle and, uh, and the, the unfilled. Because you got this guy, Chief O'Brien. I may have to look and see what he's got. But uh, Chief O'Brien's not actually an officer. But anyways, I think this is really helpful in establishing who's what. And they had an episode where everybody gets amnesia, and they think that Worf is in charge because he has this giant sash, which can't be easy to sit with if it's metal. And he's like, well, I'm the only one with the decoration. Obviously, I'm the one in charge, right? And they're like, okay, fine, I guess we'll do that. I do want to talk about some key episodes. You know, I'm not going to pick apart the whole series, but I'm going to tell you some of the best and some of the worst. I realize that early on we have an original Trek vibe. The way shots are framed, uh, maybe the plot lines, things will happen that remind you more of the old Star Trek than where this show ends. And I feel like it hits its stride maybe season three or four. You have various cast departures. You have Dr. Crusher disappearing for a season, being replaced by an older lady, and then coming back. And it's weird that she she leaves, but Wesley Crusher's still there, and then she comes back, and then Wesley Crusher goes, which is a really good trade-off, I feel like. Well, the first episode, Encounter at Farpoint, two-part two uh, series pilot premiere. This episode I think would cause a huge problem today for fans of a franchise getting a new series. Huge problem. There's a big ask here. First of all, you're watching Star Trek without any of the people you care about from Star Trek. Granted, very last scene, a super aged up DeForest Kelly comes by and he's an admiral and he's like, oh, this is a the ship's got a good name, you take care of it, it'll take care of you, that sort of stuff, right? You're not getting, oh, well, we wanted uh, Captain uh, Kirk. Wait, we want another Captain Kirk. It's probably better to get a new cast in with new characters 
than it is to say, here's new people playing the parts you like. It's probably easier to go that way. It was a shrewd decision at the time. You go up in the years and you have new technology shown. You have like the holodeck, which is awesome. A lot of possibilities with that. You have some holodeck centric episodes. I'm not entirely sure the holodeck is feasible. It actually seems to me like in reality, we would be closer to getting the matrix to work, tapping into your mind and getting you to think things are real than to build simulations physically, you know, especially with people uh, walk further away. How does it's confined space? How does any of this work? Right. Well, that's the sort of thing that is shown off in Encounter at Farpoint, the first episode, also introduced to the most powerful being in the Star Trek universe, Q played by John DeLancey, who seems to share power with the Continuum, the collection of Q. He can get cast out of it and become like mortal or something. He has to put himself to get back in. He can find another Q, like there's Q offspring or some shit. Things like this go outside the reaches of science fiction and become far more fiction fantasy, a la Star Wars, than what Star Trek is usually cared to be called of. People look at Star Trek like, that's sci-fi, and Star Wars, that's sci-fantasy. Well, or fantasy-fi. But I'm thinking that Q's ability to be God, to do whatever he wants at whatever time, uh, to torment people, you could look at it as a way to get people out of any sticky situation. Well, we just need to get Q to help us. But he is a bully. He's looked at as a villain, He doesn't, there's not really a lot of people that die because of him, but he does prove a point and he usually saves the day for them to make himself look and feel good. But to come across a character that just throws the rules of the science out the window, that seems a little damaging, doesn't it? Suppose there was a Star Wars series and you said, look, no characters you like are coming back. And all of a sudden there's somebody named George Lucas who can appear and can make anything happen. And he's super powerful. People would kind of lose their shit over that, wouldn't they? I feel like the worst episode, and this is one that you guys are going to get pissed about. It's the inner light, the flute episode. This is an episode people say, oh, it's at the top of the list. This episode sucks. Huge. First of all, you have this probe comes by, scans to the Enterprise, knocks out Captain Picard. And then he wakes up and he's in another play. Everywhere they go, people are always like in this like Earth Tones, uh, Pueblo uh, facilities, like low tech environment, super crazy peaceful. They may have like a ridge on their nose or whatever. And they're supposed to be a different alien race. But it's like every time they go someplace... People are at the same stage of development, like near middle ages. So he gets down here and they say, oh, your name's this and this. And uh, don't you remember? And I've had memory problems. And he stays in this life for like 70 years. But intermittently, they'll cut back to the crew and show them trying to resuscitate Captain Picard, completely ruining any kind of plot twist or development you can get out of this because you know it's in his head. You know there's nothing real at stake here. He has a wife, he has kids, grandkids, whatever. They talk about, uh, they have a situation with the stars dying. Oh, well, we, we're we building a probe. Well, can't we get away? No, we, we can only send this probe. So that he realizes that he he was knocked out by the probe to experience life as these people in the only way to pass on their legacy. And he's supposed to be fulfilled by this. He learns how to play the flute. He, at the end of the episode, he's able to play the flute. He's not pissed that they made him experience 70 damn years for nothing. A big lie. He's not pissed about that. He wakes up, oh, I was knocked out for 20 minutes. Well, it felt like 70 years. You're telling me that this, these Stone Age assholes get the technology to build a probe that can do shit that... The Federation can't knock out people and make them experience stuff at at your desire. But you can't send a few people away from the star to colonize some other area. Bite me. Now, this actually does make a better episode out of this. This episode, one of my favorites, is Lessons. In this episode, Picard, using his fancy fluting skills, strikes up a romance. 
with a visiting uh, cartographer, astronomer lady. She's on the ship. She's a little sassy. She plays the piano. They have a little music lesson thing. They, they go up to Jeffrey's tubes. They're climbing around. They, they have a little date. They hook up, and Picard falls in love. Ah, But there's a disaster on a planet below. They need to send her. He can't show favorites. And when the chips are down, it's looking bad. It's looking like, well, he just sent her to die. You know, I was really pulled into it. I was like, oh, come! I don't remember her dying or not. You know, we know, we know he's not with anybody in the, in the movies. And things like I don't, I don't remember how this comes out. There's suspense, but she makes it. But he's like, look, you, you got to get away from here. I can't be wrestling with this and and treating you differently and or sending you off on these kind of things. You know, good luck. The best overall episode is Lower Decks. In Lower Decks, you have a really cool concept here that I feel like can only be done in the later stages of a show when you are familiar enough with the core characters that you don't need them anchoring the plot of the episode. Let me explain. The junior officers who we've never met, I mean, well, hell, there's a a nurse that Wesley Crusher works with. We see her sometimes, but... The junior officers are up for promotion. They have uh, evaluations. And they they live their lives. They have some romance, whatever. They've got poker games. They're talking about their superiors. And this is a really cool episode because the plot will happen without them knowing it. All of a sudden, there's a Cardassian aboard. And it's like, well, the, this girl gets pulled into it. This uh, Bajoran Sito, was that her name? Yeah, I think it was Sito, but um, she was in a previous episode where she was, and and it was actually the actress and the character, and I like the way how many of these things you think are one-off episodic concepts actually have some kind of footing in a previous episode, if you were paying attention, or it'll be brought up and everything. She was in a thing with Wesley Crutcher, there was an accident, uh, somebody died, and Picard was was tough on her and said, hey, so uh, you, you've been lying about your record, all this stuff, but I had you put on the ship on purpose because I knew I was the only one who could give you a fair chance, but but we got this uh, Cardassian aboard. He's defecting. We need to bring him, we need to take him back to their uh, territory, and we think that with you being a Bajoran in your conflict with them, that the, you'd make the perfect mule to do this, and she's up for the task. And an unfortunate thing happens, and from all accounts, it appears as if she got killed during this uh, dangerous uh, mission while trying to escape uh, out like uh, there was a ha- uh, escape pod capsule for. Her. She goes in it, and it and from their reports, it got blown up. Maybe she's captured. You could hold out some hope. But you have uh, the other officers are, you know, talking about her life. And she was a favorite of Worf. She w- she did his tests and and she was a good security officer. And, they, and it does a lot to flesh out all these other people on the ship. You got maybe a thousand people aboard and, and you wonder what their lives are like, you know, aside from Whoopi Goldberg who comes and goes. And I don't think she's in the last season. She's in like season two through six or so. Just kind of serving drinks and talking about how she's old. But I thought that was a really cool episode and my personal favorites. And I don't know if I'm going to watch some more Star Trek after this. May try to continue up the chain or, you know, uh, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, maybe Enterprise it's available on there but maybe i should check out the original i've i've seen maybe i don't know five or six episodes when i started streaming that a couple years back then uh, resumed star trek tng when they got it upgraded to hd specs Uh, one more thing barely worth bringing up you ever notice how in star trek or, or star wars anywhere all the ships are on like the same plane like, the Enterprise will roll up on somebody, and they're all facing each other. They don't come in from the side. One of them's upside down. Isn't that a little weird? Because there's really no point of orientation in space. Or is this something the Federation agreed upon? But that's my take on Star Trek TNG. What'd you guys think?